Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to another webinar sponsored by the North American Vascular Biology Organization's Education Committee. I am Anar Cuervo from the University of Illinois at Chicago, and along with Linda Shapiro from the University of Connecticut, we will be moderating today's session. We are pleased to welcome our speaker, Joshua Hutchison from the Biomedical Engineering Department of the Florida International University. Josh will present his work entitled cardiovascular mechanics and extracellular vesicles. The study presented will discuss the role of vascular smooth muscle cell mechanics and mechanotransduction in the formation of calcifying extracellular vesicles, which nucleate mineral in the vascular wall. Today's webinar is being supported by the Ted Rogers Center for Heart Research at the University of Toronto. Before we get started, I wanted to go over some logistical aspects. Throughout this webinar, you're gonna be able to switch between the phone audio and the computer audio in case you're having a problem with either one. You can see this information in the audio section of the GoToWebinar control panel. If you experience any technical problems, please click Help tab at the top of the control panel. You can also scroll to the bottom of the Help screen for technical support phone number. At this time, I'd like to welcome Mr. Amrala Bakshan Nick, also from Florida International University. He will monitor today's questions. Questions will be handled in two ways. Throughout the presentation, you can type your questions into the question box in the control panel. These questions will be answered at the end of the presentation. So Mr. Bakshan Nick will compile all these questions and then post the questions to Dr. Hatchison. At the end of the question and answer period, provided that there's time, attendees can also ask additional questions. So if you still have a question, please raise your hand by clicking in the hand icon on the left side of your control panel. Then I or Linda will call your name and your mic will be unmuted and you will be able to ask your question live. This webinar is being recorded and archived on the NABO website for future use. So our speaker, Dr. Joshua Hutchison, joined the Department of Biomedical Engineering at Florida International University in August 2016. He is also an active member of the Biomolecular Science Institute at Florida International University. His research focuses on the mechanical and molecular contributors to vascular calcification and aortic valve disease. And he is working on developing non-invasive techniques to diagnose and treat these pathologies. So without further ado, let's hear from Dr. Hutchison. Thank you very much, and I'm uh, ha really happy to be here to present some of our work to you, uh, and, and appreciative of the organizers for, for putting all this together. Um, so, so, let me get this to work, there we go. Uh, so I'm going to talk a bit about uh, some biomechanics, uh, just, just briefly, and then talk a, quite a bit about some mechanobiology and what leads to vesicle formation, I'll get back into that shortly. And then I want to close the loop by, by bringing biomechanics back in. And, and what we try to study in my lab is how changes in the cellular environment uh, lead to uh, changes in cell phenotype, which then try to remodel the uh, extracellular environment to kind of offset those, uh, those biomechanical pressures. Uh, and and uh, so we're going to focus on vascular calcification. And we'll start with just a little bit of understanding of how vascular calcification affects uh, tissue mechanics. So I know I don't have to, for this crowd, I don't really have to talk too much about um, uh, problems with, with cardiovascular disease. Um, but what has become clear is that calcification is a leading predictor of uh, cardiovascular morbidity and mortality. Uh, so over the last decade or so, this has really become uh, much more appreciated. And with the last AHA um, uh, recommendations, um, statin use uh, may also be dependent upon uh, your calcium score. What has also become apparent is it's not just whether or not you have calcium in your arterial wall that determines the uh, likelihood of having a cardiovascular event. It also seems to be somehow associated with uh, the density of the, the calcification there. And so uh, if you have a, a fairly um, low dense uh, calcification, so meaning that it's uh, what has also often been described as spotty calcification, uh, you're at lower risk than if you have uh, um, if you, uh, you're at higher risk and if you have a uh, higher density calcification, uh, which may be lower risk. And, and, and so we still don't completely understand why this is, but we have some 
thoughts about it. And, and, um, and we believe it's because of a difference between these large stabilizing macro calcifications and uh, small micro calcifications that are associated with uh, ongoing and developing calcification. And so uh, if you have an atherosclerotic plaque that's formed and you have a lipid pool uh, in your uh, in your plaque, uh, you know during systole, the the uh, fibrous cap that covers that lipid pool uh, experiences a lot of deformation. And and the thought always was before that uh, calcification is good because calcification basically reduces that deformation of the plaque and 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 provides some stability there. So this plaque this cap doesn't rupture because once that cap ruptures, uh, you have your myocardial infarct and your stroke downstream. However, if you have uh, calcification that forms in the wrong place, and, and we think about these micro calcifications that form actually in this fibrous cap rather than beneath it, um, they can they can further stabilize the uh, destabilize the, the cap. So you have this hard bone-like inclusion there, this calcified uh, mineral there, uh, and, and you actually increase deformation, increase cap stress around that. And a lot of this has been shown by work from uh, Shelley Weinbaum uh, at City College New York, working some with, uh, with Louis Cardoso up there. Um, and they've done a lot of finite element modeling using um, uh, some histopathological samples and some uh, CT imaging, and, and, and really show nicely the, the structures and the morphologies of these calcifications that can, that can cause plaque rupture uh, and, and have done some nice analysis even uh, showing predicting sites of plaque rupture based upon um, calcifications that they see there. And so we think that these microcalcifications are a major contributor to plaque instability. And so when we were working with uh, Shelly Weinbaum, some of this first stuff I'm going to show you is from work that I did while I was in Elena Ikawa's lab up in, up in Boston as a, as a postdoc. Um, we were able to nicely see, uh, well, we were able to, to uh, get some human tissue. So you're looking at um, uh, carotid arteries here, and we can see uh, these plaques forming in these carotid arteries. And, and this is by micro CT with, with Dr. Weinbaum. Uh, and we can see uh, large calcifications form. And, and in some of these plaques, we do indeed see uh, these small focal micro calcifications that seem to be uh, in the fibrous cap itself. And, and, and so we do see that morphology. And when we took a closer look at some of these, uh, these plaques, and this is using scanning electron microscopy with, uh, uh, we used with X-ray spectroscopy to look at mineral. And this is density dependent color SCM that you're seeing here. So the, the, the orange color you're seeing here is mineral. The green that you're seeing here is other extracellular matrix components, mostly collagen, we think. And if you look at these uh, calcifications, you'll notice that they're very heterogeneous. It's not like a single sheet, like we you know, may often think of, of, of mineral. It's made up of these much smaller substructures on the order of, of hundreds of nanometers. We also showed this using some optical techniques. We can show that, that again, this is, uh, th these are now um, uh, also human carotid arteries. Um, we've used uh, osteosense, which is a near-infrared calcium tracer to label the calcifications. Um, in the, on this side, we're using uh, two-photon microscopy and second harmonic generation to view collagen. So the collagen is green, the calcification is in red. And here we used a dye, a collagen dye that we got from Carlin uh, Buden in, uh, um, in the Netherlands. Uh, and and uh, so that's the collagen in green and the calcification in red again. And we can see, again, these calcifications tend to be made up of these much, much, much smaller uh, calcifications. So even this would show up if you look, use von Kassa or Lisner Redstein, you would see a large calcification here, but especially along the edges, we see these much smaller calcifications that are that are hundreds of nanometers um, in size uh, that we could see. And one thing we noticed is that again, we're do, doing we started out this doing a lot of just kind of histopathological characterization, trying to understand what are these calcifications, what are macro calcifications and micro calcifications, and and when we looked at um, a cross section here, we noticed these micro calcifications, these very small inclusions tended to be in gaps between collagen fibers, often in the fibrous cap itself, whereas large calcifications tend to be bordered by really thick collagen fibers. This is using um, picroceres red. So the, the, the um, yellowish orange fibers here, those are, that's uh, uh, collagen. Those are really mature collagen fibers, well aligned collagen fibers. And the green and the dark areas are, are less mature and, and absent of collagen fibers there. And so we saw these microcalcifications in these regions uh, between collagen fibers. 
So that was from human tissue. That really didn't tell us anything about causality. We couldn't say, okay, you know, this is why a microcalcification forms versus a macrocalcification. This is the difference between the two. Um, but it allowed, it gave us some endpoint analyses and things. You know, we we saw this association with collagen, and so we said, can we do something simple? Can we take a you know a collagen hydrogel that we can make in the lab? That's a three-dimensional collagen hydrogel, and, and can we reproduce calcification growth in that hydrogel in a way that we can uh, monitor it. And one thing that we were interested in doing is looking at the growth from these small extracellular vesicles released by uh, cells in the, in the plaque. And so work that was already ongoing in Elena's lab, Elena Akawa's lab, uh, and, and others had shown that much like what happens at least in, in, in parts of bone growth, it seems, Cells can release these extracellular vesicles that are usually, um, they're on the order of 100 nanometers in size, and they serve as nucleating foci for the mineral. So they, they capture enough calcium and phosphate in one area to get mineral nucleation, and then the, the mineral growth can, can start from there. And so we wanted to study it from that level uh, to understand how the calcification is built. A problem with that, though, is that these vesicles are too small to really you know, see by any uh, traditional optical microscopy techniques, uh, and uh, and the, the 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 amount of material present in these vesicles. Anyone who does vesicle work can tell you this is extremely tiny. So it's really hard to do proteomic analyses, and, and so so we really were trying to um, to figure out a way to kind of get a handle on them and, and watch this process occur. And so what we did was we cultured hum, uh, human coronary artery spin muscle cells in, in, in a calcifying media. So we used a media that a lot of folks use with a uh, beta glycerol phosphate, uh, it's a phosphate source, dexamethasone and l ascorbic acid promotes uh, collagen formation. And, and so these cells calcify um, uh, in, in vitro. But instead of using the cells themselves to try to understand how the mineral grows from these vesicles, we took the vesicles away from the cells, put them in these collagen hydrogels, and then looked to see if we could image over time the calcification formation and understand perhaps even the difference between microcalcifications versus large if we had a controllable system. So we were really excited when, when we did it. We were able to image uh, the calcifications that formed and showed really nicely. So this is a, another one of those density dependent color SEMs that I showed you before. That was from the human tissue. This is from our hydrogel. It, it, the, the structures that formed at least just visually were, were strikingly similar. We can also see that here. This is using some confocal imaging. This is uh, the red here is our uh, near infrared fluorescent tracer, the calcium tracer. So we see these calcifications forming in these larger structures um, between collagen fibers. Uh, if we look at TEM from atheroma, the structures that we're forming, these uh, structures here look very similar. In the TEM, you can see the mineral forming here. And then all around the mineral, we see all these vesicles uh, inside the structure. Uh, so morphologically, we form very, very similar uh, structures. But it also seemed that um, that that spectroscopy, using spectroscopy, we could show that the, the structures were similar as well. So I'll show you more of that in a moment. But what we noticed is that over time, the vesicles, these little vesicles that we took from the smooth muscle cells and put into these collagen hydrogels, we were seeing them grow over time and not really grow, but we were actually seeing it seem was that they were being lost. And so the vesicles, as they're calcifying, so from day one to day seven, we see a smaller fraction of uh, these 100 nanometer sized vesicles. And then we start seeing things that are much, much bigger on the order of several hundred nanometers by, by seven days. And that's about the time that we start seeing detectable calcific mineral in these uh, vesicles as well. And, and we can, uh, uh, again, use some spectroscopy and show indeed the calcium and phosphate uh, forming from, from these structures here. And so it gave us the idea that these vesicles are aggregating together, uh, and, and that's what's really uh, causing the mineral uh, growth. And we looked to see uh, how similar the mineral uh, that we saw uh, forming was to what we see in tissue. And so this is mineral that we were able to isolate at the end back out of our collagen hydrogels. This is a vessel again from, this is a, a cross section from the human uh, carotid artery. Uh, and we can do, th this is what's doing FTIR uh, spectroscopy. And we could show that over time, so this is uh, uh, in our collagen hydrogels are this, this hard to see gray line here. Over time, the, um, uh, 
the, the, the mineral that's forming in our hydrogel looks spectroscopically very similar to what we see in the human tissue. The red here being a large calcification, this being a microcalcification. And we, one thing we did was we increased the collagen content in our hydrogel. And as we increased the content, we actually saw a decrease in um, this mineral maturity. It looked, it looked similar to a microcalcification. I'll get back to that in a moment. And we went back to our cells and said, okay, now we see that these vesicles are, uh, seem to be aggregating together. That seems to be what's producing our mineral growth um, and forming our calcific structures. And we can, we can reproduce that without cells present because we took the vesicles away from the cells. Um, and so we went back to our cultures, just the actual cultures themselves and said, can we now uh, look back at these uh, in vitro cells, just in vitro that are calcifying in a culture dish and, and, and see if we see something similar there, or is this just a function of our uh, collagen hydrogels that we're making? So we took smooth muscle cells, again, and put them in these calcifying media, uh, and we could show that over the course of 21 days, uh, we see an increase in collagen content in, um, uh, in this media, from, from in the calcifying media versus a control media. Uh, that's not, not terribly surprising. It's been, been shown before that this media induces uh, increases in collagen. And we used that uh, collagen pro that we got from, uh, from Carlin Boten uh, and our calcium tracer to look and see how these uh, calcifications formed over the course of 21 days. And, and we were able to see nicely, very similar to what we're seeing in the collagen hydrogel. We see these collagen fibers, uh, we see the calcifications that are forming uh, between collagen fibers. It seems like the calcification is getting stuck in that collagen as the cells produce this collagen matrix. And then uh, we see these very, very small calcification substructures that appear to be um, aggregating together to, to build a larger calcification structure. Um, one thing that we also did that was, that was pretty, pretty cool is we were able to take advantage of some resources we had up in Boston at the time uh, to do some... Um, uh, some structural illumination microscopy, uh, some high, super high resolution microscopy, and we were able to see things. So again, I told you using traditional techniques, you can't visualize uh, traditional optical techniques. You can't visualize these individual vesicles. Um, but using uh, this uh, modality, we found that we could label our vesicles with cell tracker dyes, so indicating that they are enzymatically active. Uh, and so it gave us a hint that these are actually vesicles from the cells that contain some enzymes. We used uh, things like uh, cell trace and, and, and we're able to load them into the vesicles uh, and we could see individual vesicles. So this scale bar here, I believe is 250 nanometers. Uh, so the things are the size of individual vesicles coming together uh, to build uh, these calcifying minerals here. And so, uh, so we think we have, you know, one of the first kind of, you know, uh, you know, in a, and this is in our collagen hydrogel, a controllable um, way to visualize mineral formation from individual vesicles uh, uh, in the system. So back to that collagen story I was telling you uh, a, a moment ago. So um, the, the idea that we really came to as we watched these vesicles come together and build this mineral was that collagen seemed to be acting more as a scaffold than anything. Um, so it seemed that the collagen kind of directed the vesicles where to go uh, and really controlled how they then aggregated and came together to, to build the mineral. And so as we increase our collagen concentration, we um, decrease the size of those aggregates that can form, the size of these vesicle aggregates that can come together and build mineral. Uh, and so we were able to quantify that in our collagen hydrogels. And another thing we did was we we made collagen hydrogels, uh, so kind of a, a double collagen hydrogel. We, we would cast a, a high concentration collagen hydrogel, and we would let that set, and then cast a low concentration collagen hydrogel just beside it. Uh, and they actually overlap just a little bit. And then we take our labeled vesicles, and we actually label them with two colors here. We added vesicles at different time points. It's not really important for what I'm showing now, but the green and and blue are actually fluorescent signatures from labeled vesicles that we've added back to the system. And, and, over, and then the red is uh, calcification. That's our, that's our calcium dye again. And what you can hopefully appreciate is that over time, uh, these vesicles seem to be lining up right at this border right here. They're lining up at this border and they're starting to form these larger calcifications right here at the border between the low concentration collagen and the high concentration collagen. Um, and this is not so dissimilar from what we see 
uh, in tissue as well. So this is from a mouse plaque. Um, and, and so, uh, you know, we were, you know, kind of started thinking about how this relates to plaque development. And so um, we're, we're, we were thinking about, you know, the plaque develops, and so mature calcifications that are kind of in the middle of the plaque here as it develops, we see uh, the calcification lining up right along where we would see a fibrous cap up here, uh, and then less mature calcifications kind of down here, deeper in the plaque and, and, and at the edges as well. So it, it really led us to a new model um, of how calcification is forming. Um, and and what, we, what we think is happening is when you have a nice, stable fibrous cap, when you have a plaque that is going to become stable, that, that is not uh, at risk for rupture, uh, those dense caps, those dense plaques that we were talking about before that, that maybe even be plaque stabilizing, you have this thick uh, fibrous cap, this thick coll collagenous fibrous cap that prevents those vesicles from associating with each other within the cap, and so they form these calcifications beneath the cap and form those larger calcifications. Whereas if you have infl inflammation, so the kind of classical vulnerable plaque where you have inflammatory cells that are breaking down that plaque, that, that fibrous cap in very local regions, you can get diffusion of those vesicles up into the cap in places where they're not supposed to be. And so you get these little holes that form. And, and, and again, it's a diffusion problem. So you get these holes that form in the, in the collagen. You can get an aggregation of vesicles there. They can produce a microcalcification, which can further destabilize the plaque. So that's kind of the story of what we uh, found from, um, from this work, and it was published uh, in Nature Materials in, in 2016. Um, but moving on, I want to tell you a bit about where we think these vesicles are coming from. And then I want to bring it back to, to, to why they uh, may exist in, in the first place. So um, one of my interests is in mechanobiology. And, and um, so I'll tell you a little bit more about these vesicles and where we think they're coming from in the cell now. Um, so one thing that we know about these vesicles released by the cells is that they're enriched in a protein called tissue nonspecific alkaline phosphatase. Um, so it seems to be loaded into the vesicles. This, this protein, this enzyme, um, hydrolyzes uh, uh, phosphate um, sources and, and, and produces free phosphate. It hydrolyzes pyrophosphate into two free phosphates. Those phosphates can be used for the calcification. It also pyrophosphate is an inhibitor of calcification. So it, it both gets rid of an inhibitor and produces phosphate that can be used for the mineral formation. And we show that in the cells, um, uh, uh, when these cells, blue muscle cells, when we put them in this calcifying media, uh, they increase their alkaline phosphatase over the course of say seven to 14 to 21 days. Um, and, uh, and this is just looking at the mRNA level as well. And if we inhibit that alkaline phosphatase, we inhibit calcification. So the red here is showing the actual mineral. This is an alizarin red stain. So we see increased mineral in the calcifying media. If we add an inhibitor to that alkaline phosphatase, we completely inhibit, alkali, uh, inhibit calcification in this system. And, and that alkaline phosphatase is loaded into the vesicles as well. And so um, we showed that uh, calcifying vesicles that uh, that that make mineral and that uh, centrifuge uh, we can centrifuge out really early using ultra centrifugation. So basically, these these vesicles become dense as they become calcified, uh, and we show that we could we could uh, remove them from the rest of the vesicle population after only ten minutes. So they are more dense. That dense population of vesicles are all of our alkaline phosphatase positive vesicles, and so uh, so these vesicles seem to have alkaline phosphatase. It seems to be important for for calcification. And so I was doing a, a study with, uh, with Claudia Gosch, um, who's now in, in Aachen, Germany, uh, and we were, we were in Elena's lab at the time, and she was trying to understand how this alkaline phosphatase got loaded into the vesicles in the first place. And, and so we had a paper that was focused on uh, sortolin, and sortolin seems to be a very important trafficking protein in this uh, process. It traffics these vesicles. Uh, or at least is involved in trafficking these vesicles around in the cell and producing, you know, loading everything into the vesicle that um, that leads to to uh, to the formation of a calcifying vesicle. Uh, but one thing that caught my eye while we were working on this was that caviolin one is a very important component in this process. And so um, when Claudia was doing some of her immunoprecipitation studies of uh, uh, calcifying cells and, and, and precipitating sortolin out. Caviolin 1 was always there uh, and associated with sortolin. And, and we actually, this was all in the paper that we published in JCI. 
we found that silencing caviolin one led to a decrease in alkaline phosphatase activity and it led to a decrease in calcification. Um, and we also uh, showed this in, 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 in CAV1 deficient mice as well. And, and also even looking in uh, TEM from, from uh, I believe this is from, this one's from a human plaque, but we saw this over and over again, that regions of calcification, if we looked at where uh, a cell was, was close to a calcification, we saw that this mineral is dark here, seems to be very closely associated with, with caviole on the cell surface. And, um, and so that, that gave us a, a clue that, that calcifying vesicles depend on caviole for formation, at least uh, uh, some, in some way. And we're still trying to understand this, exactly how this, this occurs. But what we think happens is that endocytosis of these, these caviolar domains um, uh, traffics uh, uh, these vesicles inside the cell where we get invaginations, get endosomal vesicles, uh, uh, or, I'm sorry, intraluminal vesicles, so a very classical multivesicular body uh, that forms in, in these structures. Uh, and during this process, things like alkaline phosphatase uh, and other proteins that may be crucial for calcification are loaded into these vesicles. This vesicle traffics back to the membrane and those smaller vesicles are then released where they can uh, begin the process of, uh, of calcification. And I was interested in caviolin one because of its known role in um, uh, in mechanics and in mechanobiology. So one thing that caviolin one does is it buffers the cell membrane. This is uh, caviole in, in general. This is one thing they do is buffer the cell membrane from changes in um, in tension uh, or, or deformation. So with, when the membrane is stretched, uh, these caviole that exist as uh, little little cups in the resting membrane are flattened, uh, and and so. Uh, I was wondering how mechanics may play a role in this. And, and one thing we were thinking is that, you know, endocytosis uh, and vesicle formation actually requires plasma membrane constriction. So um, in order for this vesicle to pinch off from this membrane, this length here uh, has to be reduced uh, for that to, to occur and be thermodynamically favorable. Uh, and then there's a variety of enzymes in, involved in that process as, as well. And so we were wondering, can we use something like a tensegrity model that describes cell mechanics to understand how uh, changes in the cell mechanical environment or the extracellular matrix or the uh, cytoskeleton uh, influence the likely shape of those caviole in the likelihood of, of endocytosis? And, and so we're trying to get a qualitative feel for this. And so uh, we, we chose to use a... Um, a, a pretty simple but elegant model developed by uh, Patrick Prendergast over in, in, in Dublin. And, um, and just looking at a, using a, a force balance and saying the cell, a cell tensegrity really just exists as a, a, a force balance between contractile elements associated with actin cytoskeleton, uh, elements that resist uh, compression, which are like microtubules, and the, uh, the, the substrate outside of the cell. So we're not going to go into too many details in this, but this is kind of what we were um, focusing on. And, and one thing we started focusing on is what happens if we change things outside the cell? How does that influence uh, the formation of these vesicles and, and the movement of, of caviolin 1? Uh, so we're doing a variety of things now. We're changing things like this, uh, substrate stiffness and a variety of other things. But one thing that we've really clued in on for now mainly because we've seen some, some pretty uh, striking results, uh, is uh, the role of uh, mechanical stimulation just using a flex cell, so applying cyclic stretch to cells. And so we have a flex cell device, we grow cells on a substrate, um, that is the, uh, a deformable substrate that's loaded into this flex cell, and we can deform the cells, and we, we've done this at 5, 10, and 15 percent. We collect the vesicles, and then we're looking at, uh, I'll show you some protein uh, studies in a moment, looking at caviolin 1, uh, in these vesicles, we're, and we're looking at uh, characteristics of vesicles with uh, a device called a TRPS, tunable, tunable resistive pulse sensing, with QNano. So I'll explain that a little bit. This um, is our new way of trying to understand better how vesicle properties change um, uh, it, with a variety of stimuli in, in, in our lab. Uh, vesicles, as I mentioned earlier, they're really hard to study. And so what this device allows us to do is a particle by particle analysis of the vesicles. And, and it's based upon the culture principle where you have a nanopore 
And so these are your, your vesicles here. They don't really look like this, but a good representation of, of, of a, a heterogeneous population of, of vesicles. And we can put a voltage across this core, this pore, and as vesicles move through, they disrupt the current uh, through the pore. And, and by uh, disruption of that current, um, we can tell something about their charge and their size. And so the length of time uh, that they spend in the pore, or really their velocity through the pore tells us about their charge and, uh, and their size, the amount by which they disrupt the current, the amount of volume in this pore they take up as they go through tells us something about their size. Uh, so it's a really nice vesicle by vesicle um, uh, um, quantification system that we, that we have, and we're we're trying to play around with this to really um, uh, understand unique properties of, of calcifying vesicles versus other vesicles in in, uh, uh, in our system. But one thing we noticed early on, we've actually repeated this several times, and I haven't had the new graphs with with the nice uh, stats on yet, but um, we see a dose dependent increase. Um, in uh, uh, the amount of vesicles released uh, with strain. And so as we go from a non-stretched uh, control, I guess you could say, so something that uh, uh, cells that were placed on these flex cell plates but not stretched to 5%, to 10%, to 15%, we see an increase in, um, in the amount of vesicles released. And if we look at the, the profile, it seems that, uh, just showing you here, the 15% uh, strain, uh, if we look, the blue here is a profile, this is particle diameter versus concentration of a non-stretch sample, and then the red is the 15% strain. The vesicles seem to be converging on a smaller size, uh, so a little over 100 nanometers. They seem to be uh, also maybe be a little more negatively charged. They move through the pore faster. So the blockade baseline duration is less, and so they're moving through faster. That's indicative of, of a negative charge. They're moving faster to a positive electrode that's on the bottom side of the um, that nanopore. So, so this this whatever this is this stretch is doing is leading to um, smaller, more negative vesicles is the take home there. But importantly, we wanted to look and see what is cavulin one doing here. Um, and we looked both inside the cell. So this first western blot here is uh, inside smooth muscle cells. Uh, the second western blot is from extracellular vesicles. And uh, this is just the pro, um, uh, densitometry now um, uh, uh, of, of these Western blots. So this is just the quantification of these Western blots. This intracellular cavulin one, extracellular cavulin one in the vesicles. So we've we've ultra centrifuged them out. And what we see is that as we increase the stretch and the strain magnitude, we see a decrease in the cavulin one inside the cells. And we see an increase in what's loaded into extracellular vesicle. And again, this is something we've actually repeated uh, several times now. This is a very, very consistent, um, consistent finding. And so it's showing that the, the mechanical stimulation is leading to uh, alterations in cavulin one trafficking. Uh, and we, we did some uh, immunostaining to try to figure out how is, how is that? Where is the cavulin one going? I'm showing you just two uh, images here. Uh, and the red is cavulin one. The green is, uh, is actin, so it's a phylloidin stain, and the blue are the cell nuclei. And we can see it for non stretch controls. We see some cavulin one inside the cells. We see a lot of it around uh, the surface of the cells. It seems that when we increase the stretch, uh, and we have, apply 10% cyclic stretch for 72 hours, uh, we see a redistribution of this cavulin one. Uh, inside, uh, inside the cell uh, in, in, in a perinuclear uh, location. Uh, and this, this is important because I want to compare this to findings that we had with Claudia Gosch before when we were looking at uh, trafficking of these vesicles that is important for, uh, for ultimately formation of the calcifying extracellular vesicles. And one thing we noticed is that with calcific stimuli, we saw a redistribution here looking at sortolin into the, um, the Golgi. Uh, and, and that seemed to be important for uh, activating alkaline phosphatase. And so I've told you alkaline phosphatase has to get activated in order for, um, for calcification to occur. And there are enzymes in the Golgi that, uh, that are responsible for activating alkaline phosphatase. So this redistribution to the Golgi may be a very key 
important step in that alkaline phosphatase activation. And we're inducing that with an in, with, by applying uh, uh, cyclic stretch to our cells. So, so that might be an initiating event in calcifying extracellular vesicle uh, formation. So we're still trying to understand that. We're, we're now going into um, uh, kind of finishing up those initial studies. We're, we're going to you know, knock down uh, uh, cabinet one. We're going to try to play around with, with uh, things in the way, similar ways we did with, with the sortulin work to try to better understand why this uh, happens and, and how it leads to calcifying vesicle formation. But I want to end a bit with talking about why this may happen in terms of the biomechanics and, and so and, and why stretch could lead to this. Because what we think, what we see is that, uh, so if we, we apply cyclic stretch to cells. Uh, we'll, we'll stretch a cell and then we'll go back to its resting uh, point and the stretch of cell and the its resting point. This is after the cell has been sitting and being cultured in a non in a, in a static environment for a while. The cell seems to respond to this, and I forgot to mention this earlier with our actin. We see increased actin stress fibers in our in our stretch cells. And what we think the cell might be doing is is once it gets stretched that you know uh, for a little bit, uh, it wants to counteract that stretch counteract the increased deformation by increasing stress fibers, so an element that can help it resist the, the increased stretch. And so it gets stretched and it goes back to its normal state. But at some point, the cell is going to start pulling back. And when it starts pulling back, we think that it's possible that in what we, what we could call the diastolic phase, in, in this low stretch uh, phase, that the cell actually feels a net compression. So it resists the, the increased stretch, but now it's feeling a bit more compression. And if that happens, then that could be the, um, uh, provide the energy that allows this caviole to be endocytosed. And so this is what we're working on now is to really, to really try to show this. But when, then once those, once those caviole get endocytosed, they can start the process of uh, formation of, of calcifying extracellular vesicles. Um, and this could be important. So if we look, again, using this model again, if we look at uh, a more negative number here indicates really an increased contraction. The cell is becoming more contractile. There's increased pre-stress. The, the, the actin fibers have shortened. So as, if you have a certain substrate here that the cells are sitting on, this is kind of a softer substrate, say like a flex cell plate. If the cells increase their contraction, this length is going to decrease. So basically there's, a, there's something like a strain term here and it's going to decrease. One thing the cell could try to do to offset that, offset that would be to increase extracellular stiffness. And one way to increase extracellular stiffness could be to increase calcification um, and, and cause mineral to form. And so, again, this is now uh, just a bit of con conjecture, and we're working on, on showing this. Uh, but we think that this could be kind of an important, you can think of it like a rheostat almost, uh, you know, a way for the cell to, to understand um, I'm being compressed too much, or maybe I'm, I'm feeling too much tension, and, and to figure out what to do uh, and, and how to modify the extracellular matrix accordingly to, to offset that and get back to what the cell thinks is a homeostatic uh, condition. And so just a couple more uh, uh, slides here to show you some other things that we're trying to do to better understand these vesicles and how they nucleate the mineral. Again, this is a, this is a really hard thing to do because uh, these vesicles are so small. And we can't see them. And so one thing we've also started doing is collaborating with some partners here uh, at FIU in physics to do some computational modeling of, of how mineral might form in an idealized vesicle that we can, uh, we can work um, in silico. And so we, we published a paper this year or this past year uh, showing mineral formation uh, over time in the vesicles and how it associates, how this mineral associates with vesicle membrane, why a vesicle might be needed and how it might accelerate um, uh, calcification. And an important finding from that work uh, was that the, the presence of phosphatidylserine uh, would predictably increase the rate of calcification formation. So that, that's shown here. The, the association between calcium and phosphate groups is increased in phosphatidylserine. That negative charge of the phosphatidylserine lipid seems to help immobilize calcium and allow it to associate better with um, with phosphate. And so just kind of bring it to, to a close here. Um, th this associates with, or th this, this, this may um, 
kind of go along with, with what we're seeing with Caviole being involved in this process as well, because there have been a variety of studies uh, coming out that have come out over the last few years that have shown uh, distinct cellular pools of phosphatidylserine in Caviole, in the Trans-Golgi network, endocytic uh, organelles, and these multivesicular uh, endosomes. And, and um, in fact, one last year showed that the amount of phosphatidylserine really dictates the assembly and dynamics of Caviole uh, in, the, in the plasma membrane. And so we're starting to maybe get a handle on what's inside these vesicles, how do they form, why do they form, what's their purpose, and then hopefully later on that can lead us um, back toward an understanding of, of how mineral forms uh, in our vessels uh, and, and how we may be able to control this either for increased stability or to get a clean vessel uh, that has no calcification and, and greatly reduces the, the chance of, of plaque rupture. Uh, so with that, I would like to uh, start by, by thanking my lab group. Uh, this has been a lot of fun. So I've been at FIU the last couple of years. Uh, so this is some of our lab members and, and family. This is our newest lab member that uh, came on board uh, uh, almost two years ago now. Uh, and I'm very appreciative from, uh, for funding from the Florida Heart Research Foundation uh, and the American Heart Association. So thank you so much, Dr. Hutchison. I am going now to turn this over to Mr. Bakshan Nick to see if there are any questions that he should direct to Dr. Hutchison. Uh, okay, thank you so much. So what the question is that, uh, where do the alkaline phosphatase and cavulin one interact? Yeah, so we're trying to understand kind of when, when they come together in the cell and, and we don't know if uh, that happens at the plasma membrane itself, um, or if, you know, once the, the, these vesicles are endocytosed and, and go to the Golgi, if, if it happens there. Certainly once it gets to the Golgi, we have some, some evidence that uh, there these vesicles do have alkaline phosphatase in them. Uh, and so we think it may be loaded at that point, but we're not, we're not exactly sure yet. As a second question, uh, are these vesicles uh, exosomes? Uh, good question. I, I don't know yet. Uh, we, we, I don't think that they're traditional exosomes. Uh, um, I think that uh, traditional exosomes can calcify. I think uh, work by Kathy Shanahan has shown that and in her system with higher phosphate, uh, those may be something more like traditional exosomes. Um, these, don't, these don't seem to traffic in quite the same way as traditional exosomes. Uh, the dependence on cavioli would be a little bit different. Uh, so I don't think they are traditional exosomes, but you go to vesicle meetings and, and people argue over these labels all the time. So I'm very hesitant to just call them exosomes. I'm also hesitant to call them matrix vesicles, similar to what people call in the bone, because I think they are even a bit different than matrix vesicles as well. So I think uh, they're somewhat unique, but we're, we're still trying to get a handle on what they are. And as a last question, uh, what has happened when these calcifying vesicles aggregate outside of the cells? Yeah, so... Um, so once once they once they aggregate, um, well, one we're trying to figure out you know how they aggregate and 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 what's the driving force for that. Uh, once they aggregate, they seem to fuse together, and and that's another process that um, that's been very interesting. And, and and one of the things we want to move toward in some of our computational work to see if we can understand once that mineral starts forming, how is it driving vesicles together? How does it drive uh, the shape of that mineral? We see these very nice round structures in our um, all of our microscopy, you see it in EM, we see it in confocal, we see it in uh, two photon microscopy, we've seen it in the structural illumination microscopy, we see these nice round calcifying structures there that are bigger than vesicles, they aren't single vesicles, they're vesicles that have come together and we're trying to understand those shapes and, and, and how that also plays into plaque stability because uh, uh, mineral shape is one of the most critical ma uh, components of predictions of increased plaque stress according to some of those studies by, by Weinbaum. I have one more question. Uh, is microcalcification more highly present than uh, macrocalcification in regions of high cyclic stretch in the vascular vasculature? Ooh, um, I don't, no one has looked at that yet. Um, I, to my knowledge, uh, you know, it, it would be a, it would be a tough question to uh, to get at, but you'd have to have samples from different regions of the vasculature, and that's sometimes sometimes hard to get. But that would be that would be interesting to see. Um, uh, but I, but no one no one has studied that uh, in any kind of detail yet to see 
if microcalcifications are, are more prevalent in one region versus the other now. Okay, so the I guess there is no more question here. Okay, thank you both. Um, if there are any other questions from the audience, please raise your hand. You can click on your hand icon. Um, and once I recognize you, you can state your question. Does anyone have a question that they want to ask live? Okay, so... Okay. Uh, sorry, I think that uh, there, there is another question here. I could okay. just, just post it. Uh, what drives extracellular vesicles aggregation in extracellular metrics? If it is a uh, diffusive process, why was there aggregation at the interface of the low and high density collagen gels in your in vitro system? Okay, yeah. Um, yeah, so we think that that there's two things going on. So one, um, so the vessels have to be close to each other to, to start aggregating. And so, and, and so it's a it's a diffusion limitation there. So when you get to that border where you have, the, the vesicles can move more freely through uh, the low density collagen and, the, and uh, you know, less uh, interference from the collagen in terms of just their, their diffusion throughout this, um, uh, this matrix. You know, we add them to a local point and then they start spreading out. Um, and, and there's, um, I'm sorry, we add them on top of the gel and they start spreading out. And, and once they hit that barrier, they can no longer diffuse or the, the diffusion is, 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 is hindered. And so at that point, they start lining up. And so, you know, they're, they're, they're reaching a bottleneck point. Uh, and once they start lining up, there's some, um, uh, you know, you can imagine it being uh, some balance between the diffusion limitation and the, the speed at which they start aggregating. And so they can't diffuse as much anymore. So they there's some force that's driving them together. What drives them together? I don't know. There's some recent work that indicates that there actually are some active, or at least some 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 maybe some cell um, or some receptors on the vesicles. Uh, and I saw some some folks from Elena Akawa's lab actually present this uh, this summer in Bordeaux, which is really interesting. I think uh, uh, Max Rogers was working on it, and, and uh, there may be some receptors that are important in bringing these vesicles together. Uh, I still don't know if it's that or if there's something about the actual mineral formation that changes the vesicle properties that, that causes them to come together or not. All right, so we have also a hand um, from Michelle Bendek. I don't know if that was the question that was already posed or not, but I'm gonna mute you, Michelle, just in case, so you can post this question or a different question if you want. So Michelle, you're unmuted. That was the question from our Toronto group that Josh just answered. Um, can you hear me? Yes, yes I can. Hear you. Okay. Um, is there anybody else here? We've got a group here, Josh, listening. So is there anyone else that has any questions before we? Yeah. The first was Craig Simmons' question, but he um, wants to ask another one. No, just keep right. talking. Can you hear me, Josh? Uh, I can, Craig. Yes. Okay. Great talk. Um, question also, so in valve interstitial cells, Patrick Matus group shown that strain promotes mineralized particle formation in a row rock dependent manner. Is how does that does that relate to the mechanobiological mechanisms you proposed or yeah, yeah. I mean I, I think I certainly think it could. And we, you know, we haven't really we, we're doing some valve work, but I've so far um, haven't gone this direction with the uh, with the Vic ship. That would be very interesting. And 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 you know, it seems that it would, right? I mean, but, you know, if you have an increase in, uh, in, in rock activity, increase in row activity that's uh, leading to uh, uh, enhanced uh, stable cellular contraction, um, that according to that same tensegrity model that we're using, that could promote uh, increased pre-stress and promote endocytosis of cavioli, increased calcifi calcifying vesicle formation. So it, it would seem to be consistent with what we're seeing, uh, but we haven't tried it yet with the uh, interstitial cells. That's really interesting. Anybody else? Okay, thanks very much, Josh. It was a really interesting presentation. Thanks very much for agreeing to do this. Thanks, Michelle. Thanks, Greg. Thank you, Michelle, for your questions and Craig. Uh, now I can unmute Bria Macklin to ask um, the question that you want to ask. 
Sabri, if you want to ask your question, you can speak now. Oh, hi, thank you so much. Uh, I'm not Sabri, I'm using her account, um, but I have a question. Um, so it looks like these studies have all been done on um, sa on culture samples or um, you know cultured material, but not on uh, mice or fish or anything, unless they have been. Uh, if they are, um, I'm interested in seeing where um, if you looked at like tracking the vesicles uh, from those different stiffness or stretch conditions across whole organisms. Yeah. Um, no. Though. You're right. I mean, all we've seen so far is, I mean, we uh, see that we'll, er, that our in vitro system seems to um, recapitulate what we, the, the endpoints that we see in vivo well. Uh, and the other thing that we know is that caviolin 1 deficient mice have uh, reduced vascular calcification as well. So that, so that, you know, supports what we're saying here. But in terms of trying to uh, see uh, traffic, increased trafficking, um, in some of these animals or changes in trafficking is it's very difficult to do, but it's something that I would love to do and, and, and to see if maybe um, to the point that the question that was asked earlier, can we look in maybe different vascular beds and look at changes in, uh, in cavioli trafficking? Uh, can we do things to increase hypertension, for example, and look and see how that changes cavioli endocytosis and the formation of calcifying vesicles? So I think those are, those are studies that we would, uh, we would love to get into. Great. Well, thank you so much. Thanks. So thank you everyone for your questions. Um, and th thank you, Dr. Hutchison, for this wonderful talk. Uh, we hope you found this information beneficial. These webinars are brought to you by the Navajo Education Committee. Our next webinar is in the planning stages, but we will also have a speaker from Vascular Biology uh, 2018 18, that was held in October at Newport. So look for more information in the Navajo Newsbeat site. Also, please fill out the evaluation form at the end of the webinar or when you receive it in a subsequent email and let us know what you thought about the webinar or if there are any topics that you may want to see in the NABO webinar presentation. So with this, thank you, Dr. Hutchison, and thank you all the audience for this wonderful talk.